Revelation 2 and verse 1. We read to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You as a near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Lord, as we come to the study of your word tonight, guide us into all truth. Spirit of God, help us to have ears to hear what you're saying. Lord, don't let, us be a stu- don't let us be stubborn. Don't let us, God, be in a state, God, where we are not open to receive from your word. But, Lord, let our hearts be open tonight. And let us receive what your spirit would speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tonight we're going to be beginning this look at what Jesus will be speaking to the seven churches, to the seven churches in Asia Minor. John the Apostle, as we looked last week, is on the island of Patmos. And we read that he, when he got this vision, that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And Jesus, the risen, glorified Jesus, appears to him. And he sees him and he describes him. He describes the glory of Jesus Christ. He describes what he sees when he gets this vision. And Jesus appears to him and tells him in verse 19 to write the things. In verse chapter 1, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. He tells them what you are about to see, what you have seen and what will be. I want you to write it down, record it, record what I am about to say. And Jesus, the Son of God, the eternal God, Jesus, Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus is getting ready to speak to these seven churches. He's getting ready. Could you listen? Could you think about it for a moment? Could you imagine? Could you imagine if somebody came to the door of the church and said to you, I have a letter directly from Jesus? Could you comprehend what that would do, how that would be? This is what this is. This is a direct letter to these churches from Jesus. He's writing to these churches. He's writing to seven churches. These are literal churches in the first century. These are literal churches. But what he says to them and what he is going to uh, bring to them and say to them applies to every church in every age. What you see here is a description of seven, seven different types of churches. And as he addresses each church... What you see is you see a description of Jesus. Then he commends them. He gives a commendation. He tells them what they are doing that is good. And he criticizes or he shows them what they are doing that is wrong. And then he offers them correction. And then he gives a command to them and a challenge and a promise. And it's the same with every church that he is going to address. And as we go through this, you're going to see that there are two churches that have no criticism. There's, there's two churches that he has nothing bad to say about, nothing to criticize. And then there's another church, one church, that he has nothing good to say to at all. There's nothing good that he will describe to them or say to them. And we know that's in chapter 3, the one church, the one church, 
even the compromising church, even the dead church, even the church that was controlled or under the authority of that prophetess named Jezebel, he has good things, something good to say, but there's one church he has nothing good to say to. It's the lukewarm church. The lukewarm church. Nothing good. You see, he's going to address these churches. There's seven churches. The loveless church, the suffering church, the compromising church, the dead church, the Jezebel church, the loving church and faithful church, and the lukewarm church. And each time Christ speaks, he says at the end of his address to the church, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. You see, not everybody has an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. <laughs> and we must have ears to hear what he is saying. He's always speaking. He's always doing something. The Lord is always working. But many times we don't have ears to hear. and We don't have spiritual eyes that see it. And we become so earthbound and earth focused that we lose sight. But we begin tonight, he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, this is where Jesus, the Son of God, begins. He says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. And Christ here is speaking to his church, and he uses this word angel, and we looked at that last week that that also means messenger of the church. Messenger of the church of Ephesus. And he begins with the church of Ephesus. Ephesus was the first in distance to where Paul or John is. Ephesus also was the most prominent of the cities that he is writing to and perhaps was the most prominent of all of the churches. The city of Ephesus was an important city even to Rome. It was a port city. And it was an important city to, for trade and for commerce. The city of Ephesus was a free city, meaning that it, though it was under the jurisdiction of Rome, it was free to appoint its governors and it was free to appoint its own leaders. It had no troops that were stationed there. It was home to many temples, but the most prominent of the temples was that of the temple of the goddess Diana, or, Ro or as the Romans would call it, Artemis. And this temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It also had a massive Colosseum that would seat 25,000 people. And it was this church, it was in this city that the Apostle Paul, along with Aquila and Priscilla in the book of Acts chapter 18, began this church. They came to Ephesus. It was this church that the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, he stayed there for two years teaching in the school of Tyrannus for two years. And it says that from Ephesus that all the word of God went out through all Asia. That means that Ephesus was the center to where all the gospel, where all these other churches were planted. They came out of Ephesus. We read also that it was at the church of Ephesus that Timothy was the pastor. What a church. What a history. Amen. The apostle Paul starts the church. Timothy is the successor and appointed to... And then not only that, but we read later on that the apostle John had ministry at Ephesus. Later on. We read in verse 1, to the angel of the church at Ephesus. And then you see this description that is given of Jesus. He says, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, the one with the stars in his hands, 
meaning that he has control over them. He is the one, it's in his right hand. That symbolizes authority and power. The seven stars are in his right hand and we know that that represented the messengers or the angels of the seven churches. And then he walks in the midst of the golden lampstands and we know from verse 20 of the last chapter that the lampstands are the churches. They represent the church and he's walking in the midst of these seven golden lampstands. That is, he is not oblivious to what is going on. He is not absentee. He is not a landlord that has no idea what is taking place on the inside of his church. He walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. He walks in the midst of his church. As Paul would say, he is the head of the body, which is the church. He is in the midst. And here you see, beginning in verse 2, he gives gives a word where he commends them. He gives commendation to them. This is something that is good in Ephesus that he's getting ready to say to them. He says in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience... And that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. He says, I know your works. He knows your works. He knows. He knows your works. He sees. He's not oblivious. To your faithfulness. Amen. He's not oblivious to you being faithful. He sees you being faithful. He knows your works. It doesn't pass his eye. He sees you laboring for him. He sees your work. He sees your devotion. He says, I know your works. I know your labor, your toil, and your patience, your perseverance. He sees them. He commends them, number one, for their devotion. They were fully devoted to the Lord. They were devoted to Him. They labored for Him. They did works for Him. They toiled for Him. And then He said, And you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. Secondly, He commends them for their discernment. They know who is true and they know who is false. They had discernment and they used, it, they used the test that Paul gave them, that Timothy gave them, that John the Apostle gave them. They were a discerning church. They could tell if this person was false and that person was true. They could not bear with those who were evil. They were discerning. And these are, Jesus is commending them. We have to be discerning, amen? We have to be discerning, especially in these, what do we say often, these last days. We have to be a discerning church because many false prophets have went out among them. This is exactly what the apostles warned about. And they were a discerning church. Turn with me back to the book of Acts. After this church was started... The Apostle Paul, who spent two years laboring in the school of Tyrannus, taught them. And then a ministry that totaled roughly about three years. He was getting ready to depart from Ephesus and he knew, I'm not going to see your face again. He knew. He told them, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be delivered up and I may not see, I'm not going to see your face again. And he tells them in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26, he gathers together the elders of Ephesus. He calls for the leaders of the church at Ephesus and he brings them to him. And this is what Paul said to them in verse 26. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Verse 29, here's his warning. For I know this, 
that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. He told them there were going to be false teachers. He told them, he warned them with tears running down his face what do you see here this church at Ephesus took it to heart amen amen they took it to heart they took that warning to heart they were they could discern between a true apostle and a false apostle not only that but John turn with me to 1st John chapter 4 in 1st John chapter 4 He says in verse 1. Verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. They heeded the warning of John. John would say in 2 John, verse 7, just one page over, he says... Many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Verse 10, he says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. You see the church there in Revelation could not bear with those who were evil. They tested those who said they were apostles. And then he even goes on and he says in verse 3, he keeps commending them. These are good things. He says, you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. You've not become weary. You have persevered, you've labored, you've done, you've been faithful, you've not grown weary. These are all good things. Amen. These are all good things. All of these are good things. Look at the commendation that he gives. They were devoted. They had discernment and sound doctrine. Man on man, that sounds like a solid church to me, right? They were devoted, they had discernment, and they had sound doctrine. They knew God's word and they tested the spirits. They tested. And here you're going to see... Jesus shows them there's something desperately wrong. He's going to show them where they have gone wrong. And he gives them this criticism. And we have to take this to heart. We have to take this to heart. This is Jesus speaking. Verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. He says, I have this against you. You have left your first love. We get this picture. We understand this great reality. Understand this. Understand. We have to understand this. Yes, Jesus wants your devotion. He wants you to be sound in doctrine. There's, these are not at odds with each other. We have to be there. But He wants your heart. He wants your heart. 
He does, he does not want you to just go through the motions. He does, he does not. Jesus sees it. He does not want us to just go through it without a heart in love with him. And he sees it. And he wants our hearts. He wants us to maintain that love that we had for him, that relationship with him, that that love for him is the main thing. That as you labor and as you persevere and you endure, he wants your heart to be beating for him, loving him. He is after our heart's desire. It's an old story that a preacher told one time. He said, I was out deer hunting. I was up in a tree stand. This deer came into view and I took aim and I shot it right in the heart. And I hit it dead on. And that deer kept on running. That deer kept running for a hundred yards, even after I shot it and, and it had, its heart was dead. There was no more blood flowing. You see, there's a lot of people in the church, their heart's been out of it a long time. And they just keep going. And God's calling us to love Him. Amen? He's calling us. To serve him out of a heart of love, a desire for him. And then he goes on, and here's his counsel. Here's what he counsels. Here's what he counsels you in that situation, you and me. If we ever come into that situation, here's what he says to do. Here's what he calls you to do. And you see this bears direct application here and now. This wasn't just the church back in the first century that this has application for. This has application right now. Here's what he says in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. The first thing he says is to remember. Remember. Look back on when you were first in love with me. Remember from where you have fallen. How many you remember... When you got saved. How, how many remember that? I remember when you first got saved. You did stuff. You didn't even know what you were doing. I witnessed to people and I probably did more damage when I first got saved than I did good. Because I was just, I wanted to tell somebody. I would go back. I remember I, when we, me and Michelle first got saved, I remember she, she didn't have her license at the time, and I would take her to work. And we would pray. We would go to where I worked, because I worked as a welder, and we would go back in the office, and we would kneel and pray. And it would only be 10 minutes. It wasn't no drawn-out long prayer, but it felt when I did that like heaven came down, like God was so real in those moments. And it wasn't a laborious thing, a, a drudgery, like, oh, I got to pray because it's my duty to pray. It felt like a heart that was just so overflowing with love for the Lord. Got out the Bible and didn't know. I had Sunday school as a kid, memorized the Bible as a kid. I was from kids' church, and all, so I had a foundation under me, but I didn't know the Word of God. And I remember just reading the Bible, and it was just, oh, it was so awesome. It was so fresh. That's what he's calling you to remember. Remember from where you have fallen. That's what he's calling you back to. Your first love. Your first love. I remember I grew up. I'm just sharing you all these stories. But I was a kid. And when I was a kid, growing up in church, to me it was always... It was always a struggle to lift up my hands. There were times when I 
wanted to lift up my hands, but I had an older brother that I thought would make fun of me. I had other kids from the youth group that I thought would make fun of me, so I would never lift up my hands. But I remember when I first got saved that first Sunday I went to church, I was just, I don't care. You know, some people, that's, you, you think that's funny. Some people, that's a big deal to them. Some people, it's a big deal. They, they, there is something about lifting up your hands. And I remember when I first got saved, I didn't care. Amen? I didn't care. It didn't matter. Would praise Him. Would tell people about Jesus. Would invite people to church. When's the last time we invited somebody to church? He said to remember from where you have fallen... When's the last time we witnessed and invited somebody? Say, come to church. Come to church. He says, remember. Remember what? Your first love. Your first love. And then he says, this is his encouragement. Remember from where you have fallen. Repent. Repent. So he doesn't want us to just keep going in a state of loveless activity. He doesn't want you to just keep going, you and me. If we ever get to that place, he doesn't want us to just keep going, keep going through the motions. I know we're called to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in our work for the Lord. We're told not to grow weary in due season, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. We're told all of these things to be planted in the house of the Lord. And even when you are old, even when old age, you will still be flourishing. You will still be fruitful if you're planted in the house of the Lord. But he tells us, he tells us, in the midst of all of that, our heart should be beating for love for Jesus Christ. Amen? And he tells us, if we ever get to that spot, repent. Repent. Come to him and say, Lord, I've left my Bring me back. And then he says, return. Look at what he says. Repent and do the first works. Do the first works. So he says to return. Return. You know, it's really not complicated, is it? We make so many things complicated. We get our eyes on so many different things, we get our eyes, we lose complete focus. We get our eyes fixed on other people. We get our eyes fixed over here. But Jesus says, return and do the first works. And you understand, these were devoted people. These were people who were laboring for the Lord, discerning. He tells them, go back and do what you did at the beginning. Do the first works. This don't necessarily mean that the whole church at Ephesus had to go back and get baptized again. But it means they were to go back and do what they... That natural outpouring of love. How many remember? And I got to be careful drawing analogies with this, using this as an example. But how many remember... When you first started dating your wife or your husband, you wanted to be around them, didn't you? I hope you did. Oh, my goodness. You wanted to be where they were. Did you not? You wanted to smell them, right? You wanted to be near them. You, you couldn't care. You couldn't care where you were. You just wanted to be around them, am I Right? I remember I did, love will make you do stupid, stupid things. Amen? It will make you do dumb things, right? Because you were so in love. But could you imagine, now think about this. Think about this with me. I want you to be, think about this. If your spouse came to you and said, it's our anniversary tomorrow... Let's go out to, let's do something special. 
and you said, well, if I have to, if you went, all right. Now, some of you have been married long enough where you could probably get away with that. No, you haven't. But you see, when we serve the Lord with that attitude, it does not please Him. We get up on Sunday morning and say, oh, I've got to go to church. Got to go to church. Oh, no, we're, we're, we need to repent. We need to repent. We need to repent. We need to repent. Got to read my Bible so I can go watch TV for four hours and feel like I did my deed. We got to repent. We got to repent. Got to go get my prayer time out of the way. We got to repent. No. No, he's the main thing. Amen? He's the main thing. He's the main thing. Repent and do the first works. But then he gives them a warning. And this is so concerning. He says in verse 5, Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He tells them, I will remove your candlestick. I will remove the light that you give off, your witness, your usefulness. I will take it away. I will remove you. Literally, you will go out of existence from being a church. You will not be the witness in the world. I will take your lampstand away if you don't. I will remove it. You see, he walks in the midst of the candlesticks. And he cares for his church. But then he says in verse 6, he gives another commendation. And we need to take this to heart, what he is about to say. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He mentions them again when he speaks about the compromising church. And they go hand in hand with the doctrine of Balaam. And we'll talk about that when we get to the compromising church. But the deeds of the Nicolaitans or the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in verse 15. It is believed that what we are reading here when he speaks about the Nicolaitans, that these were the followers of Nicholas from early church writings, from early church fathers, they make mention of Nicholas and his followers. And what they reveal, and this is a source outside of Scripture, but we can deduce from it in Acts chapter 6 when the seven deacons were appointed in the church to take care of the distribution of the food for the widows, one of them was Nicholas. And Nicholas, at some point, according to some of the early church fathers, became apostate. That is, he rejected the faith and he went off into falsehood. He turned away. And he began to teach Christian, what is called, what would be the original Christian liberty. And you have the same, you have the same mentality today. Antinomianism. Christian liberty, and I'm going to explain what that is. Christian liberty is basically this. You can accept the forgiveness and the grace of God and live however the heck you want to live after that. You can live in idolatry, immorality. You can, it doesn't matter. You're free. You're free. The law, he fulfilled the law, so you're free. The followers of Nicholas were known for being utterly immoral in their behavior and idolatrous. And you remember during the church, during this time in Rome, in the late 80s, 90s, what was going on? Emperor worship, 
false gods everywhere, temples everywhere, sacrifices being made to false gods everywhere. And these followers of Nicholas were told, hey, you can indulge in this, you can indulge in that, and still, and still be a servant of God, still serve God. Now, what does Jesus say? He says, I hate the deeds. Not only that, but he says in verse 15, I hate the doctrine. I hate what I hate. That's Jesus speaking. Jesus says, I hate their deeds. I hate their doctrine. And I want to make something really clear. There's nothing new under the sun. The Word of God says that there is nothing new under the sun. That everything that was in the first century, every so often it's just repackaged and given a different name. It goes on. There's no new heresies. There's no new... It may seem new, but if you go back just a little bit, you'll see, wow, that was in the 1800s, or wow, in the 1600s that movement was there. Oh, in the second century they were doing that. It's the same thing today. There's a famous interview that you're probably all familiar with. You could look it up after I mention it. But a very, very prominent talk show host, billionaire, talk show host, billionaire, who at one time claimed to be a follower of Jesus, a Christian. And one of the people in the audience one time during a question and answer session confronted Oprah. Sorry, I didn't mean to miss her name. Confronted her. Probably get blocked from Facebook now. No, I'll get blocked for what I'm about to say but confronted this person and said, you claim to be a Christian, but you openly endorse homosexuality. You openly endorse and say that there are many ways to God, that all paths lead to God. How can you claim to be a Christian, but you... And to the glee of the crowd, and the crowd applauded what Oprah was about to say, and because that's the spirit of the age, that's the spirit of the world... Here's what Oprah, re Oprah responded. Well, my God is a God of love. My God just wants people to be happy. My God wants them to fulfill what desires they have and only wants good things for them. Only once. My God is a God of love. And to the praise of the woman, she just quoted Scripture back what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But I want you to understand tonight. I want you to understand. When Oprah says, my God is a God of love, I want you to understand this. Oprah's God is not real. Oprah does not know the true and the living God. Oprah has created an idol that fits into what she thinks God should be like, that justifies people living in immorality. That's what you are committing. You are breaking the second commandment. You are fashioning an idol that doesn't look like the God of the Bible anymore because there are certain portions in God's Word that you don't like. So you fashion a God and you bow down to it that looks more like you. It's the same doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It's the same thing. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus says, I hate, I hate it. I hate it. I want you to see that's in red. I don't know if it's in red in your Bible. It's in... Read in my Bible. Amen? Amen. But then he goes on. And here's what he says. He who has ears to hear. You see, because here's the... There's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain of bondage. There's power in the name of Jesus to break even sexual perversion. Amen? Where you don't have to be identified by what you're attracted to. You don't have to be 
under the dominion. There's power in the name of Jesus to break porn addiction off of people. Amen? And if you're watching that, indulging in that, you need to repent and cry out. He'll break it off of you. Amen? He'll deliver you from it. There's power in the name of Jesus to set people free from every sexual sin. I don't care what it is. His blood cleanses and makes clean and makes you holy. Amen? He can tear down strongholds in every person's life if they will just come to Him. But if I tell this person, you're perfectly okay to do that, I'm a false witness. Amen? And I cut them off from the grace and the gospel of Christ. I cut them off. And I tell them, just keep doing what you're doing. God's okay. That's a lie. And you see, when Jesus says he hates it, why? Because it keeps people from coming to him. If you think you're right where you're at, you're not going to come to him, right? And then he says in verse 7, He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says, you need to have spiritual ears to hear what I'm saying. We don't want to be like the people in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 where the writer of Hebrews wanted to tell them about Melchizedek. He wanted to take them deeper into the mysteries and deeper, but he said, you can't take it. You're dull of hearing, meaning you don't want to hear it. That's what he's saying. You don't want to go deeper. You're, by this time, you ought to be teachers, but you still need milk. By this time, you ought to be a whole lot further, and I ought to be able to talk to you as spiritual people, but you can't take it. You're not ready for it. Even now, you're still not ready. But we want to be people that have ears to hear. We want to be people that, as Peter said, that desire the pure milk of the word that we may, what, grow thereby, that we may grow thereby and move on from milk to meat, move on to the meat that's going to nourish us and build spiritual muscles in our life. Amen? We need to have ears to hear. And then he says, to him who overcomes. To him who overcomes. How do we overcome? Well, a little bit later as we study this book, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by what? The word of our testimony. We overcome how? Because he has already overcome. We, o we overcome to him who overcomes. And then he says, he gives them this promise. And he alludes back to the Garden of Eden. I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I will give them access to the tree of life. That means eternal life. I will take you back. I will take you back. As this, and this is what we see at the very consummation of this book, that we are back in the presence of God. We are back in paradise. Paradise where Adam was, God was with him. God was with him in the garden. He was in the presence of God. And Jesus says to us, I will give you access. I will let you eat of that tree of life that is eternal life, which is in the paradise, the presence of God. And tonight, church, as we close, I want to encourage you. Have ears to hear and go back. Return to your first love. Return to your first love. Remember from where you have fallen. Remember. Repent. And return. Do the first works. Go back. Go back. Amen. Amen. God wants your heart. God wants your heart. He wants you to serve Him because you have a passion to do it. He wants you to serve in the church because you have a passion for Him, for His glory. He doesn't want you to do anything 
because you feel obligated to do it. And don't get me wrong, it's good to be it's good to be faithful, it's good to be steadfast, and we all go through those ups and downs. But God wants your heart. He wants you. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you this evening. We bless you, God. We praise you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We glorify your name. We magnify your name, Lord. Holy Spirit, let us have ears to hear. Oh, God, let us have ears to hear what you're saying, what you're trying to speak. Lord, take the dullness away. Take the dullness and the heaviness of, of the ear away, God, and let us hear. And Lord God, help us to stay in love with you. Lord, help us. Help us to stay in love. Lord, I pray if we, Lord, are just going through the motions... Tonight, God, we repent as you told us to. We repent. God, we remember from where we have fallen. We remember, God, what it was to be so in love with you, God, that we served you out of a heart that was overflowing with the love of God. And, Lord, we repent tonight. And, Lord, we return. Help us to return to do the first works, to serve you with a heart of love. We praise you tonight. We worship you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen.